Hi there. My name is Adam and I work at Credit Valley Conservation. Today we're talking about climate change in the Credit River watershed. Now we've all heard of climate change, but have you heard of the climate crisis? Climate crisis is a term used to describe the current threat of climate change and to urge aggressive climate change action. The climate isn't just changing, the changes are causing a crisis, and it's critical that we act now if we wish to avoid catastrophe. Climate crisis is a new term that is being used more and more by scientists, the United Nations, politicians, and everyday people. We are at a critical turning point where we need to take action immediately and care about the climate crisis. Let's talk about the basics of climate change. In order for us to understand the climate crisis and climate change, we need to understand climate. Essentially, climate measures the temperature and weather of a certain region over a long period of time. So what is climate change? Well, climate change is referring to a change in temperature and weather across the world's climate caused by greenhouse gases from human actions and activities. The Earth's climate has been changing for millions of years, but the difference is that it changed slowly and naturally. The issue with climate change today is that it is caused by humans, it is happening at an alarming rate, and is having devastating impacts on our environment. So what causes climate change? Well, humans are emitting huge amounts of greenhouse gases into our atmosphere by burning fossil fuels for things like transportation, heating and cooling, and production of goods. Greenhouse gases in the atmosphere act like a blanket, trapping solar energy from the sun and causing the earth to heat up. Carbon dioxide, the greenhouse gas you hear about most, has increased by more than 45% since the industrial revolution started around the year 1750. It is now at its highest concentration in the atmosphere in well over 3 million years. So where do all these greenhouse gases come from? Carbon dioxide is talked about as the main culprit of climate change, which is true, but did you know that there are several other greenhouse gases that we are also concerned about? The top four greenhouse gases are fluorinated gases, nitrous oxide, methane, and carbon dioxide. Fluorinated gases make up about 3% of our greenhouse gases. They are man-made and come from products like refrigerators, aerosol sprays, and fire extinguishers. Nitrous oxide makes up about 5% of our greenhouse gases and comes from things like chemical fertilizer production and fuel combustion. Methane makes up about 10% of our greenhouse gases and comes from a variety of sources such as oil and gas production, livestock farming, and landfills. Finally, making up a full 82% of our greenhouse gases is carbon dioxide. Carbon dioxide is produced when burning any type of fossil fuel for a wide range of things like transportation, heating, and producing electricity, for example. Since it makes up such a large portion of our greenhouse gases, you can understand why much of the conversation around climate change is focused on carbon dioxide emissions. Now that we understand a bit more about greenhouse gases, let's look at climate change locally. Across Canada, we are experiencing changes in temperature, climate, and weather patterns. Canada's temperature is projected to increase by between 1.8 to 6.3 degrees Celsius by the end of this century. Ontario's 10 warmest years on record have occurred since 1998. That means 10 of the last 22 years have been record setting. 501 cities across Canada declared a climate emergency in 2019, including local municipalities like Brampton, Mississauga, Caledon and Halton Hills. Peel region is seeing an increase in temperatures, storms, and flooding due to climate change. This means more dangerous thunderstorms, an increase in tornado occurrences in the region, as well as other dangerous weather events. Now let's talk about what's going on globally. The Intern Governmental Panel on Climate Change, or IPCC, is the International Authority on Climate Change. They have stated that we must stay under a 1.5 degrees Celsius global increase in temperatures over pre-industrial times. If we don't, we risk destroying ecosystems, rising sea levels, and the extinction of entire species. Global temperatures have already risen by 1 degree Celsius and are likely to reach the 1.5 degrees Celsius threshold by 2030 to 2052 at our current pace of emissions. Let's take a look at two different climate change scenarios. The first scenario is if we are able to limit global temperature increases to no more than 1.5 degrees Celsius as recommended by the IPCC. 
The second scenario is if we surpass that 1.5 degree threshold and global temperatures increase by two degrees Celsius. In scenario one, with a global increase of just 1.5 degrees as recommended by the IPCC, we're expecting to see an extinction of 6% of insects and 8% of plants. 70 to 90% of our coral reefs are expected to be damaged by ocean acidification caused by climate change. The Arctic Sea will be ice-free a few times each century, and sea levels are expected to rise 26 to 77 centimeters by the year 2100. In scenario two, with a global increase of two degrees Celsius, we're expecting to see extinction of 18% of insects and 16% of plants. Up to 99% of our coral reefs will be damaged by ocean acidification caused by climate change. The Arctic Sea will be ice-free a few times each decade rather than century and sea levels will rise 36 to 87 centimeters by the year 2100. We can clearly see the benefit of ensuring that we stay well below a global increase of 1.5 degrees Celsius. Otherwise, we risk a pending environmental disaster. Now let's look at some local climate change issues and examine what changes we can make in our lives to ensure we stay below the 1.5 degrees Celsius increase. To bring things back locally, I need to fully introduce the organization I represent. I mentioned Credit Valley Conservation at the beginning of the presentation. You might have heard our name or seen our logo on a road sign, at a park, or on a vehicle. You may have even been to one of our parks, such as Rattray Marsh Conservation Area or Bell Fountain Conservation Area, to go hiking, fishing, or just to enjoy nature. Credit Valley Conservation, also known as CVC, is one of 36 conservation authorities in Ontario. Conservation authorities protect and manage natural resources within their watershed boundaries. So what exactly is a watershed? Simply put, a watershed is an area of land that drains into a central water body, like a river or a lake. Watersheds are also sometimes referred to as drainage basins. They come in all shapes and sizes, sometimes referring to a single stream or river, while sometimes they might refer to an entire lake or region, like the Great Lakes Basin. Credit Valley Conservation is one of 36 conservation authorities across Ontario. If you look at the map here of Southern Ontario, you can see that it almost looks like a puzzle. Each of the puzzle pieces represents a different conservation authority and the watershed that they look after. CVC is located here in the blue. Now that we know a little bit about where CVC is located, let's examine how climate change is impacting the watershed. Here in the Credit River watershed, we are already seeing the impacts of climate change. Since 1937, the average annual air temperature in our watershed has already increased by 1.8 degrees Celsius. Another big effect we are seeing is an increase in invasive species. For example, many invasive tree pests in Ontario are weakened or killed by extremely cold weather. With winters becoming warmer, these pests are becoming increasingly more abundant and causing major damage to our forest ecosystems. We're also seeing increased flood risk due to more frequent and intense storms. These storms produce extreme amounts of rain in short periods of time, causing major flooding and costing us millions of dollars each year. We've also been seeing new species from the south more often in our watershed and expect this trend to continue. For example, birds like the red-bellied woodpecker or the northern cardinal historically were found further south and rarely ventured into Ontario. Now they are year-round residents. Unfortunately, all of these climate change impacts are being amplified by human impacts on our watershed. Let's look at how the watershed has changed with human populations. This photo is from about 70 years ago. What you see here you might have guessed is farmlands, and you would be right. Let's picture a rainstorm hitting this area 70 years ago. What happens to the water? Well, natural landscapes like farmlands, forests, and meadows have a natural ability to absorb rainwater. Most of the rain would be absorbed into the ground, and a small portion of it would run off into local waterways. This is now that same area today. This is the area around Mississauga City Centre. Instead of farmland, it's now mostly parking lots, highways, roads, condos, and houses. You might remember that with climate change, we're expecting to see an increase in storms as well as strength of those storms. So what happens when a big rainstorm hits this area now? Well, the vast majority of it can't be absorbed into the ground and will run off the various parking lots, roads, highways, and houses and into storm drains. From there, it goes directly into our local creeks and streams, causing flooding. Not to mention all the pollution it has picked up along the way from things like litter, road salt, heavy metals, and oils and lubricants from automobiles. 
We can obviously see that climate change is having an impact on our watershed, and we know that this will continue for many years to come. So what actions are happening to make a change for the better? It's important to note some of the positive political changes that are happening locally, nationally, and globally. The region of Peel has released a 10-year climate change master plan with hopes to reduce emissions by 45% below 2010 levels. As mentioned earlier, local municipalities have declared a climate emergency, which means that they admit climate change exists and that actions up to this point have not been enough. The government of Canada has implemented a carbon tax in provinces and territories that don't already have a price on carbon. Globally, climate change activists, including youth, are making noise and gathering the attention of media and governments. There's some political action happening to make change, and one of the best ways politicians can make change is by investing in renewable resources. Solar, hydroelectric, geothermal, and wind are all local examples of renewable resources we could utilize in order to reduce our carbon emissions. Have you ever seen any of these renewable energy sources in your community? You can find solar panels on the roofs of various buildings and sometimes in fields. Solar panels convert the sun's rays into energy and feed it into our grid. Hydroelectric is found in the form of dams that produce energy, like the generating stations at Niagara Falls. They take energy from the water and convert it into electricity. Geothermal is much harder to see as it is buried underground. However, many businesses and even homeowners have adopted it as a means to heat and cool their buildings. It works by pulling energy from the Earth's core to heat or cool buildings. Lastly, wind power is becoming increasingly popular, and you can find these mostly in the form of large wind turbines placed in windy locations. Wind turbines take energy from the wind and convert it into electricity. So what are some of the benefits and challenges of renewable energy? First of all, we need to find suitable locations. For example, finding a windy spot for a wind turbine or a sunny location for a solar panel. Secondly, although renewable resources are inexhaustible, that does not mean they're always readily available. Some days are really calm and wouldn't produce enough energy for a wind turbine, while a cloudy day doesn't produce enough sun for a solar panel. To overcome this, we need to invest in a range of renewable energy sources so we can diversify our energy supply. Unfortunately, some of these energy sources do affect local wildlife in negative ways. Habitat can be altered in order to put up solar or wind farms, while hydroelectric dams can have a negative impact on fish populations. Some renewable energy projects can cost quite a lot of money to get started and take longer to pay back than traditional fossil fuel energy products. Finally, one of the biggest challenges is getting people on board. For example, not everyone likes the look of a giant wind turbine near their house, while creating a dam for hydroelectricity could cause unwanted flooding or damage to fish populations. So, given the challenges we just discussed, why should we be investing in renewable energy? Renewable energy, like the name suggests, are completely renewable and will never run out. The wind and the sun will always be around, while fossil fuels will run out at some point. A full 30% of our greenhouse gas emissions come from the electricity sector, mostly from fossil fuels like natural gas and coal. Renewable energy sources produce little to no greenhouse gas emissions or pollutants, meaning we can clean the air and reduce our greenhouse gas emissions significantly. Renewable energy costs less in the long run to produce as there are no raw resources to purchase such as coal or oil. Lastly, we need to lower our dependence on fossil fuels since we know that they'll run out. It has been shown that up to 80% of the electricity in North America can be powered by renewable sources. So we know how valuable renewable resources can be in a fight against the climate crisis, and we can push our governments to invest in more of this. But what can we do immediately at home to make a difference? Well, there are lots of actions we can each take in our daily lives to reduce carbon emissions at home. For example, we can eat locally grown food to reduce carbon emissions. We can try growing our own food in a garden. We can reduce or cut meat out from our diets. We can reduce, reuse, and then recycle items. We can walk or bike places instead of using a car. We can reduce electricity consumption by turning the lights and appliances off when we aren't using them. We can compost kitchen scraps to produce nutrients for our garden while reducing greenhouse gas emissions. 
We can buy a reusable water bottle to cut down on the approximately 17 million barrels of oil used to make plastic water bottles each and every year. We can talk to our friends and family about the climate crisis to help spread the word. And we can stay informed by keeping up to date on climate science and actions. So these are all great actions we can take at home to reduce emissions. But what about actions we can take on the ground to prepare our ecosystems and cities for climate change? One of the best things we can do to prepare our cities and ecosystems for climate change is to plant native trees and shrubs. You can do this in your own backyard or by volunteering with organizations like CVC on tree planting projects. Planting trees and shrubs improves an area's ability to absorb rainwater while also slowing down runoff, which is very helpful in areas prone to flooding. Trees also absorb carbon dioxide, removing and storing the carbon in their trunks, roots, branches, and leaves while releasing oxygen back into the air. Scientists agree that tree planting on a global scale offers the best chance of drawing carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere and storing it for long periods of time. In addition to these climate change benefits, trees offer numerous other benefits, such as preventing erosion, cleaning the air, providing shade to help keep cities cool, filtering pollutants out of water, and providing habitat and food for animals. Credit Valley Conservation plants a lot of trees each year, and we enlist the help of young volunteers just like you. In fact, each year youth plant about 4,000 trees in the Credit River watershed through our Branch Out program. We hope that you can join us in this fight in the near future. So we now know how great tree planting is for climate change, but are there other ways we can steward the environment to help in the battle against climate change? Well, we have a great summer volunteer program for high school students too. It's called the Conservation Youth Corps, or CYC for short. High school students can earn up to 35 volunteer hours in a single week of the summer. Volunteers help us with different environmental work related to climate change, including tree planting, invasive species removal, stream restoration, environmental sampling, gardening, and much, much more. If you are interested in participating in this program, you can visit our website, www.cvc.ca slash CYC to learn more about the program and to register. On behalf of Credit Valley Conservation, I wanna thank you for listening and joining us today. We hope you learned a bit about the climate crisis and are inspired to make a change in your life. We hope to see you soon.